be talking about how, uh, once you're done with the low code development piece, how the deployment aspect can be handled for cloud native environments. What is that all about? How to think about it, how to get the most out of the infrastructure that you're going to need for those great digital experiences, uh, agile, reliable, robust, and scalable. Let's talk about how you're going to do that and look forward to the presentation. Hello, everyone. Today, I'm going to be talking about how to think about deployment of cloud native applications in order to get the best experience out of them and to ensure that you can improve the customer experience for your digitalization projects at speed, at the speed you need to. First, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Eric Newcomer, Chief Technology Officer at WSO2. I joined in 2020 from Citibank, where I was most recently the Chief Security Architect for the Consumer Bank, and before that, Chief Architect for Treasury Trade Solutions. And there I had a security architecture within my portfolio, which explains the connection to there. Before I joined Financial Services, I was CTO at Iona Technologies, very similar to the role I have at WSO2. So I'm kind of back to the future. Great to be back in technology and helping WSO2 get into cloud native computing, which is part of what I'm helping with and part of what I'm excited about here and joining WSO2 to help make that next step in the company's history. Uh, we're successful so far in 16 years, but we need to take that next step toward cloud native computing to build a foundation for the next phase of significant growth. And that's what I've been working on here. Before this, uh, I was joined Iona. I was a distinguished engineer, transaction processing architect, digital equipment. Got a few technology textbooks out there. Worked quite a bit on some industry standards such as uh, SOAP, WSDL, Crote, uh, WS Transactions, was a uh, tech lead for the OSGI Enterprise Edition and, and so on. And I have a patent on mobile middleware for background. So done a lot of different things and have a uh, background which is very much aligned to WSO2's area of technology and on top of that been working as a customer on the customer side for the last several years so I can bring that perspective in and hopefully help the company achieve uh, its goals of uh, next-gen technology and growth. So what I want to talk about is this contrast between where computing started, where it is now, how we think about that, how we understand it, and how we figure out how to get the best benefits out of it. So on the left-hand side here is a good old trusty mainframe system, Univac, one of the very first mainframes out there running one of the very first commercial applications ever put into production. And you went into that room, you see the people here in the room, they're operating the computer, they're running the program, they're getting the results. Um, that's how it started. And often it was just one application per mainframe. And those applications were engineered specifically to run on that mainframe with that collection of hardware, the way that hardware worked, all of its resources dedicated to that one application. Whereas now on the left-hand side of the screen, this is what a cloud data center looks like. Uh, it's running hundreds, if not thousands or hundreds of thousands of consumer grade PC hardware it give you a better performance and better characteristics in many ways than a large mainframe. But this means a big shift in how computing infrastructure works, how it's all put together and how it delivers the value for your applications. But it means also we have to start thinking about how to engineer applications for this environment and especially how to deploy them, which is what I wanna talk about today. So we're talking about We've got our application developed, we've done our microservices work, we figured out how to decompose our app and make it you know, obey cloud native uh, engineering principles. And now we're going to need to deploy it out here into this farm somewhere uh, where it's gonna run. And uh, how should we think about that so we can get the best benefit out of that part of the journey? So a little bit of a compare and contrast to understand the change. Uh, back at, in the old days of mainframes and systems similar to that, even with mini computers, they were kind of dragging out the wire. They were all in the same kind of enterprise control center. And we would go to the computer and we'd go there to run the program, get the results, operate the computers, back them up. It was a place where you went to get your computer uh, resources and to do computing. And applications in those times were built really to have kite control over all those computing resources are being tightly integrated with it and were difficult to change and still are. In fact, many companies such as Citi 
are still running mainframe based applications 40, 50, even 60 years after they were developed because they work so well. They're so optimized for those systems. But that's a particular computing model and it works well for some things, but other things, you know, maybe doesn't work well as far. And it's probably also, generally speaking, uh, more expensive than running the same kind of workload on consumer grade gear, which is what you get in the cloud native environment. On the other hand, now we've got the cloud and those programs run anywhere. You can't even get into the room, even if you knew where it was. All those data centers that Amazon runs and Microsoft runs and Google runs uh, are locked down so strictly that they control even who gets on site, Never mind who gets in the building. Uh, you can see videos of these online. So if you want to check it out, check out YouTube and see what it looks like. That's the only way you're going to see what it is. You're not going to get in there and you're not even going to know where your program is running. Uh, you shouldn't care even uh, in this model. Uh, programs and data are distributed across many systems, constantly adapting, constantly changing. But this is how we get the scale, resiliency and agility needed for digitization for those digital transformation applications that you want to run in a safe, secure, resilient, scalable environment at reasonable cost and deliver those kinds of new customer experiences through those digital channels on the kind of infrastructure that they have come to expect from the leaders in the field. They're expecting constant uptime, ability to scale, good response time, all those great characteristics and constantly ability to, ability to change and be agile and iterate and deliver those new features customers want all the time. And you need to be able to get into that kind of an ecosystem where you put a change out there, you get a customer reaction and you can very agilely create another change and put it out there so customers get the kind of experience they need. And you'll only know what that is if you get into that system, into that virtual cycle, virtuous cycle of putting something out there, getting a reaction and changing. And that's how you're going to be able to provide the best digital experience for your customers and compete with the other companies that are providing that already, such as the industry leaders, Amazon, Uber, Netflix. You know, I don't need to tell you who they are. You know who they are and you know how it works. Amazon is putting retailers out of business because they have the best digital experience. And if you want to compete with that, you've got to get a website like Amazon. So Walmart has done it. Home Depot has done it. A lot of stores have done it and some haven't, and they are not doing so well. All right. So talking about that, I think we all know the, the, the why it's, it's all happening and the benefits of it and why you want to get to your programs onto the cloud. But what about the deployment aspect? How do you get your programs onto that assembly line, into that automation that puts them out there? Because Obviously, with so many computers, they cannot be manually operated. Everything has to be automated. And deployment means automation, it means CI CD pipeline, it means operational efficiencies and automation. And how do you get your program to get into that cycle, into that, uh, into that assembly line, if you will, and get all those benefits? So it means break up the functions into microservices with strict interface control so they can be agile and change independently, as we were you know, just talking about. And through the development of this microservices paradigm came the standardization of Docker containers to be able to run these microservice program units on any of these small computers that are the infrastructure, represent the infrastructure of cloud native computing. And from that eventually became uh, led to, sorry, led to the standardization of Kubernetes because once you have Docker containers, then you need this orchestration, this automation. How do you deploy those containers out there into these data centers with hundreds and thousands of these small computers and deploy it in a way that makes sense to get the characteristics that you want from your application for the agility, for the resiliency, for the scale, and so on. So that's where Kubernetes came up. So now we have standardization of Kubernetes and we're kind of done with that part of the deployment, which is kind of the point I want to make. Let's say we, we had this issue of how do we do cloud native engineering microservices based apps, how do you do cloud native deployment with Docker and Kubernetes? And I think Kubernetes represents the last significant piece of the evolution of the answer to this challenge of how do you get those programs out there and how do you get them automated? How do you get them on that assembly line? Reinvention of this stack was necessary to achieve the benefits because so much has changed from how applications were run in the mainframe to how they're, they're deployed and run in cloud native computer. But now things are stable with this evolution from microservices through Docker to Kubernetes so we can start to assume it. And the benefits of the uh, automation 
can be, we can look at the analogy where containers came from. Containers are standards for shipping. I think as every, everyone knows, big container ships, uh, containers can fit on trucks and ships and that revolutionized shipping. Uh, and this is all uh, can be automated now that you have those standards uh, in place. And the same thing is true for cloud native computing. Once those standards in place, just give us your containers, we'll figure out how to handle them, run them, load them in an optimal way and get them from point A to B in the case of shipping containers and the case of containers being deployed in cloud native environment, we'll get them at the right spot in that long, long hallways, long, long hallways in those big data centers with all those computers, we'll figure this out. That's what, what Kubernetes is for. And by the way, an interesting side note uh, here, you can actually get a data center in a container if you want, you can order them. I mean, Sun doesn't really exist anymore, but they used to sell them and IBM still sells them. And you can, if you need a data center to go or temporary data center or something like that, you just buy a container full of these little computers and put it down and, and start, start going. Just kind of an interesting side note that we are running containers, potentially in containers. Anyway, so Kubernetes, what's that all about? So I mentioned standardized container orchestration. That means figuring out where the containers are going to run in that data center, how many copies, what kind of resiliency characteristics they're gonna have, what kind of auto scale for the resources that they need in case they run short of memory or disk or, well, probably not disk, but memory or CPU most, most likely. Uh, and how do you, you know, start replicating them out? So we've got this situation where you kind of divide the work up between the control plane that figures out where things are going to go and the data plane where the things are executing. And you have this relationship between the control plane and the data plane where the work is happening to make sure that things are deployed correctly, replicated where they need to be, scaled where they need to be, and resilient where they need to be. All of this, you know, of course, hugely dependent on networking as a first class citizen of computing uh, and no problem, right? It's easy, just figure out what uh, containers you have, put your code in containers, microservices in a container, get your Kubernetes config file done, hand off the container to the config, config file, and Kubernetes figures out where to all run it and it runs and everything's great, right? But there is a catch. I guess there's always a catch. And here the catch is, if something goes wrong, if there's a problem with the handoff, when you get your containers done, you're trying to hand them off to Kubernetes with the Kubernetes config and things are not quite set up right in the Kubernetes cluster for that config to execute properly or there's some kind of error that takes the cluster down or some kind of, well, you can see here, there's a lot of things that can happen to Kubernetes because this is the official Kubernetes troubleshooting guide getting from the yeah, true Kubernetes uh, website. So. If you are in the business of setting up Kubernetes clusters and managing them to deploy your containers, you're gonna to have to deal with this. So also probably pretty well-known thing in the industry that Kubernetes has a lot of complexity. App developers really should not be dealing with it, I would say. And then when you're talking about these big leading digital companies, they will have dedicated site reliability engineering teams to take care of this to set up the Kubernetes clusters and they'll say, just give me your containers, your config files, and we'll go out and make sure the cluster is running so we can deploy all these things. But if you're a smaller shop, you may end up having to struggle with some of these things, your complexities, solve some of these complexities uh, your, yourself. So what to do? All right, so I talked about the uh, difference in computing model between mainframe and cloud and how the model of deployment has evolved from microservice through containers, through, or, orchestration of those containers in Kubernetes. And I think we're kind of at a point of stability. And we can see this in effect by seeing that everyone now is providing Kubernetes. You can get Kubernetes on all of the major cloud providers, you get Kubernetes on premise, uh, just Kubernetes is just there, it's available. Everybody's supporting it, everybody has it. That does create another challenge, which is how to deal with all the different types of Kubernetes, which one should I pick? Which one's the best for me? Should I run it on-prem? Should I run it in public cloud? Should I do both? Uh, but I think what it tells us as a software vendor is that the industry is mature enough because now everybody's providing Kubernetes that we can go to the next step and build a platform on top of Kubernetes. We can assume some kind of Kubernetes is going to be available for the applications, the APIs, the services, the microservices that are being developed. And we can start to build up that platform to make it easier for people to create those apps and deploy those apps by assuming 
Kubernetes is going to be there and starting to build a platform of abstraction on top of that. So we can deal with things like the CI CD pipeline better, more easily, the multi cluster environment, the secrets, identity management, monitoring, logging, all those things you see here, many of which you might be familiar with as service mesh kinds of functionalities and, and extra capabilities that you need in the cloud native environment. All of that now can be abstracted and a platform can be built for, for uh, deploying apps on whatever Kubernetes is going to be there because we can assume, we can assume Kubernetes will be there. And for us, this means how about, you know, we're in the business of doing API management and integration. How about a Kubernetes platform for API development? This is what we're working on. This is part of what I'm, uh, I'm helping out with when I, when I joined WSO2. We're going to be able to take uh, our development environment, abstract that, make it low code, no code, make it very easy to have a great developer experience for creating APIs in the cloud. And then we're going to funnel that into our pipeline or to our automation that we're building through our opinionated view of how all of this is working since it's matured to the point that we can make those assumptions. And we're just going to make that all automatic about the build, test, deploy, run, and publishing those APIs. Because we know GitHub is going to be there. We can assume this, that's industry standard. We know CICD pipelines are going to be there, industry standard. We know Kubernetes is going to be there. We know Docker is going to be there. We can take all of this complexity away uh, from you in terms of worrying about how you can create and develop and de develop and deploy your applications. This gives us ability to really easily provide some capabilities in our products and our future products that we're running, going to be running in the cloud around low code integration, microservices, service mesh. Uh, we have our product out now in beta. It's called Corio. You can go to corio.io, check it out, give us uh, some feedback, let us know what you think. It provides no code, low code integration, microservice development, uh, service mesh, runs the pipeline. You get a button to build, to build and deploy, deploys everything out to Kubernetes through GitHub. DevOps and GitOps processes, publishes APIs and has other capabilities of a platform uh, for observability, security, zero trust, AI and machine learning. All of this because the industry is at a point where we can assume Kubernetes is going to be there. We can start to work at the next level and provide these added value benefits to that platform. All right, so summary, summarizing up here, uh, evolution of cloud computing is clearly indicating Kubernetes is going to be there for a while. Uh, everybody's got it. People are building on it. They're starting to assume, as we are, that it's going to be there. We're not the only ones doing this. Uh, and of course, people always say, oh, yeah, Kubernetes is the standard until something else comes along. And you know, we heard this about web services when it started, but that was 20 years ago, and it's still here. Uh, and for now, the industry standard is on this, and for now, is going to be foreseeable future based on web services lifetime. 10, 20 years is not unreasonable. Even if it's only five, 10 years, still it's a reasonable assumption to make your investments and to start working on the next level, assuming Kubernetes is going to be there for the long haul, uh, you know, such as it means in, in the industry. It's not a fleeting thing. It's going to be there. Uh, sorry, all the other candidates, Heroku, Cloud Foundry, OpenStack, Mesoswarm, there were quite a few candidates for uh, Kubernetes, what Kubernetes became as the standard but it seems pretty clear now they are not going to be in Kubernetes is, and that's going to be there for a while. Uh, and of course, yes, there are some challenges, multiple flavors of Kubernetes, but we can solve these by abstracting the various flavors of Kubernetes into platforms uh, that we can start to build on for the things that, for example, WSO2 is doing around API development, microservice development, management, and deployment. So we can start to abstract all of that because we can assume Kubernetes is going to be there. And we can auto deploy with confidence and get our containers onto that assembly line. Okay, one example, just to, to wrap things up here a little bit. Recently, Capital One announced that they have moved all of their IT environment from their data centers on prem to AWS. And they published several case studies about this available to search on, on the web, get it very easily. But some of the benefits they mentioned about their investment in going to the cloud, so they have a competitive edge among, across, um, uh, against other banks by the ability to serve customers, to give them the customer experience at the speed they demand. 
because they can pr pr provide the agility and the speed to market of new features multiple times a day. They've got the automatic deployment, they've got the microservices, they've got the containers, the Kubernetes, all these things going for them that allows that agility, that time to market, that time to improve the user experience, get the feedback, and really get in there with the customers and understand what their problems are so they can be solved in really real time and get that iterative virtuous cycle going. And they position themselves now as a technology company that offers financial services as digital products. And this is part of the shift we see going on in digitization because companies must start to think of themselves as a, pro a company that provides digital products through the technology that they build. And they need help building it, of course. Skills are in short supply. So they, to vendors such as ourselves, of course, we're not saying Capital One is using us, but we're saying what we're working on is deliver products, provide the ability to achieve these comparable benefits and to think, uh, uh, support companies moving to become a technology company that deliver digital products. And to do so, they had to invest quite a bit in governance, security practices, training for cloud li literacy. So one of the takeaways that we get from case studies like this is that it should be simpler. It should be easier. We should be able to cut out some of the work involved in building up development and deployment platforms to get the benefits of cloud native computing. So our goal with this is to make things more productive, get digital solutions to production more quickly and eliminate the complexities of cloud native deployment when dealing with Kubernetes and Docker and just get things out there and focus on that, focus on the agility, focus on the speed to market, focus on the iterative development of customer improvement features and functionality and spend less time worrying about the tech complexities of cloud cloud's work and cloud native infrastructures that support deployment. Just, we can abstract that, it can be abstracted. And with that, I will say thanks and please check out wso2.com, corio.io, ballerina.io and other things that we're working on for further information.